One of the things I've always found as an entrepreneur is if you walk down, you know, the street or maybe through your school or, you know, at a family get together and you tell them about your new business idea, everyone says it's awesome. Even if they're thinking that's freaking terrible, (laughs) right? How do you get real candid truth from the customers when you're doing these feedback cycles? So let's say you've got 100,000 customers, 10,000 sign up to be guinea pigs. You send them your new mac and cheese. Do you call everybody? Do you give them an, uh, an online form? How long is the form? What have you learned about ensuring kind of truth and real signal comes out of the data? So everything has to be blind um, to the best of your ability. Um, and it's hard if you're making something brand new that nobody's ever seen before. Um, we actually used university research partners to do blinded studies for us early on. Um, they have been really like pretty great about it. Um, and you can also That's do that firm. with research. Just, no, just like, uh, 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 like get different universities around the country can do this mm. kind of thing. And there are also different firms that can do it. Um, and all of them will help you design it in an intelligent way. But even before we did that, honestly, in the aisles of a grocery store, um, you know, people actually will just tell you kind of what they think, um, usually very rudely um, if, if they're <laughs> having a bad day. So you have to have thick skin, especially if it's kind of your baby and you're, <laughs> you know, right. you got to you gotta say, hey, it's, it's chill. You know, 100 people like it and, and 100 people didn't and, and that's fine. Um, so, you know, we found, though, over time, you always have to have a benchmark. What are you comparing to? It's not, do you like this? It's which of these do you like better and which attributes, texture and flavor and, um, you know, cooking experience and whatever. And what did you think of them? And if you can blind your respondents to what they're testing, then you're going to be able to get um, interesting results that will at least tell you something. Okay. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to make a judgment call. Yeah. You get some data and and you're going to have to say, good enough. And this is one of the areas where I think a lot of entrepreneurs make a big mistake, right? They get data back that says, meh, not that great on whatever they're working on. And a lot of people, just they're so vested. They put so much energy. It's their baby, to use your language. They're so committed to it that even though the data is saying run, they, they keep going forward. They jump in. How do you stay disciplined about really hearing the data? You know, I think... It's a, that's a great question. I think one of the things that we've done right and that I really, I ascribe to, um, you know, Scott, one of our founders is he always wanted to rein in new distribution. And I think this is a really healthy way to build a business is to say, don't just go everywhere and take every sale that you can take. There are certain retailers at certain times that you might not be able to support or you might, you know, you might not be able to, um, uh, uh, manage effectively or that you might not have the resources to invest in or that might not, you might not be able to build the awareness to drive the velocity that you want in Publix in the Southeast across 1,100 stores when you've only been in existence for a year and a half. So we said no to as much or more distribution than we said yes to in our early days. And we tried to make sure that we could fully support whatever we went into. And what you have to kind of try to do is say, okay, Let's imagine we get this. How is it going to actually sell? How is it going to actually work? And it's the same thing, again, it's true in software, where some customers require too much custom work. They're too difficult. They're too big. Um, you're going to have to change your whole, you know, your whole like, product development pipeline just to suit them. You can't do that. You have to try to stay small early. And I think we just got in the habit early of saying no. And so I think we still have recognized, hey, every single product we launch risks our good name. Um, not just with um, retailers, um, of course, with retailers, but really with people at home. If they try bonds of stuff and they don't like how it tastes or like, you know, it just doesn't work for them, um, then we have lost something. And so early on, we could kind of take more risks at times. Um, we've improved our pasta three or four times since we launched it. Like we keep, um, you know, subtly improving what we're doing, our, our you know, our process of making it and, and, and what have you. Um, and I think, um, you know, we had the guts to launch something that wasn't perfect at the beginning, and that was important for just getting out there. But over time, you have to be more and more and more disciplined about what you do. And again, continue to say no to more things than you say yes to. That goes against a little bit of conventional startup wisdom. I mean, candidly, the, the phrase we all use is fuck it, ship it. Yeah. Right. You get it out there, you get feedback, you start learning. What's different here? 
right? Because you're building a product, there's a J curve, right? There's cost, yeah. time, and effort. Why not just get a first product out and find out everyone hates it? There was a, there was a, a direct-to-consumer uh, food company we looked at investing in, and they took very much a fuck it, ship it mentality. They <laughs> had a very bad product at the beginning. They got it out. They learned that X percent, you know, a small percentage of people liked it. They sent the next one. They were happy to see that doubled. And they were just following the data and accepting failure as part of the process. This feels different, what you're recommending. It feels like you're saying, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's got to be pretty damn good before you hit the channel. Is it just that they were online and they didn't have a channel risk? Or is there something, some other insight here? Yeah, it's possible that that's what it was. I think, um, you know, for us, um, and again, that might be an, an appropriate approach. You might be able to say, well, we only reached a thousand people. And if, if 700 of them hated it, it doesn't really matter because that's only 700 people that we suddenly have to win back. That can work. The difference is, and the thing that they might not have thought of is how much time you waste with lead times. Um, physical products and tech products are just so different. The packaging development, the product development, the finding a co-manufacturer to scale up your initial production, to dial in the settings to get that initial run to be as close to good as you can get it. Every one of those things has um, time to it. And going from thinking of a new product idea to launching it in the market, I mean, the other thing is retailers will only take new products, you know, on average in a category about once a year for super fast moving snack categories or beverages more like every six months. But that means that you only have so many shots. And mm. typically speaking, you know, from thinking of a product to getting it on shelf is going to be about a year. Now you can do it a little bit faster, especially if you're not trying to get it on shelf early, but investing all that time and energy, wouldn't you could just spend a little bit more time in the kitchen? Just spend a little mm. bit more time in the kitchen. You know, don't give people mm. food that they don't think tastes good because that just isn't going to work. And if you think you can do it, I mean, it's just, now what I will say, you don't need to please everybody right off the bat. Our product was better suited for people who already had to be gluten-free right away. So we mm. focused on that audience because we knew, let's be honest, the standards for gluten-free pasta were a little bit lower than the standards for regular pasta. Okay. So right. we targeted that group when we knew our right. product still had some growing to do. Over time, as we've improved it, we don't really focus, you know, we know lots of people who, who don't eat gluten um, eat our pasta, but we're able to focus on a larger, broader market because we've continued making significant improvements. You said something really interesting before. You said you were saying no to distribution offers if you didn't have the resources to give them sufficient support. What's the playbook for a food founder for giving sufficient support? What is that? So the first thing you have to think about is working capital. And um, that is not a fun podcast topic, so we're not going to go deep on it. But um, can you afford <laughs> the the uh, supply chain impact of sourcing a bunch? So when you first get an order from a retailer, there's an initial fill. That fill might be very large, and they might get it for free from you um, if you're you know paying slotting or something like that. So maybe you get paid, but in order to do that, you have to invest a bunch in resources, in, in you know the raw materials and the production and then getting it to stores, and then you get paid whatever 30, 60 days later. Um, right. That takes a long time. And when you're small, that ties up a lot of money. And you may not have enough money to do that. Now, that's not a great reason not to say yes to something if you think it's going to be good. But let's think about that when you think about how much stuff you're launching at once. You need to think about that when you fundraise also. Um, the other is marketing support. They expect you to invest in a certain amount of trade funds, which is like discounting or ad fees or things like that, to help people find the product in store. If you can't do that, if you're not going to ever be able to get sale tags up on your product and deal with the complicated set of accounting issues that come with that in the food world, it's very manual and there's a lot of issues. Um, chargebacks is the phrase that we use. Um, there's a lot of places where you can lose money that you didn't expect to. You need to make sure your unit level economics are good when you do that. And then lastly, it's that sort of, um, and the most important piece here is the, um, the, the shopper, the, the person at home, the consumer. Are you going to be able to reach them and convince them to come into a grocery store that has 40 to 60,000 products on its shelves and pick yours off the shelf when there are so many brands competing for their attention and investing money in social and in shopper marketing applications and stuff like that? So all those things, it's just to say, 
make sure that you're going to be able to invest in the in-store marketing you need to do, in the out-of-store social media brand building that you're going to need to do, and in working with you know the retailer in your own supply chain. What's the budget to launch something? Is there a rule of thumb like X dollars per store, X dollars per box? Like what? It, how do you, how does a new entrepreneur figure out what is sufficient? You figure out your payback period. Um, the industry standard is six months, but we would prefer for it to be much faster than that. Um, where you say, okay, you know, where it's going to take us about six months to break even on this thing. Um, sometimes big food companies say more like a year or even longer. Um, we prefer to be quicker because again, we don't have the resources. Um, so we prefer to pay back in three months, but you know, if you're in the three to six month range and you're actually right about it, um, cause yeah. early on, you're going to be wrong. You're going to assume a lot more sales than you get. Um, if you're actually right about that number, once you learn the pattern through trial and error, through burning a little bit of extra capital, then you'll kind of figure it out and you'll understand your kids. Again, okay, that's don't the say no to a good opportunity. Yeah, that's the working capital side and the marketing. But tell me side. about the marketing. What do you need? To, what, what's the budget for marketing? How much money do you need? Well, the, the, I, I to think support that's, a launch, how, how do you how do you think about it? What's the what's a metric? Is it X dollars per location? Is what? Is, how do you think about it? You could say you could give a number and say, look, a retailer would want you to spend about fifteen percent of your sales on trade spend, and you could call that the number. Um, but early on, we certainly couldn't do that. We didn't have the money. And most of our marketing was social media. Um, and it was directly targeting specific consumers who, and, you know, leveraging influencers and user generated content. Um, you know, I call them influencers. Some of these people, we would have people who had like 500 or a thousand followers and we're like, Hey, you know, you make good stuff. Why don't you make some stuff with our pasta? And, and that was a way for us to really build, um, you know, trial and loyalty and love for what we were doing without um, having to spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on big marketing programs. So stuff like that works too. But, you know, you could call it 15% um, in, in trade spend is what you would expect to spend. And, you know, you probably wouldn't be terribly far off. So you've been in the startup game for as long as I've known you, one form or another. Uh, we're shifting gears here a little bit. Sure. Uh, and the, the whole world, you know, is at least in the States, is reimagining food right now. All right, this is a, a big macro trend. You guys are an important part of it. The traditional tech VCs out there, and that's a lot of where you, know, you have tech and life science risk capital deployed into the system, have been, really, have been focusing a little bit on the space, but it's a, it's a tweener in terms of fit for the firm's strategies. How do you raise money as a food entrepreneur today? Because it seems to me there's not a ton, at least that I'm aware of, of infrastructure and capital sources. And you guys have been successful. You raised a ton of dough, as we said earlier in the show, about close to thirty million. How do people navigate this? Where do you go? Where do you look? How do you find it? Yeah, um, you know, I think we've actually, um, I think we started these seafood companies raising a lot more um, and treating themselves as if they are tech companies. And I think there's some danger in that because. If you can't provide, just to what you were saying, if you can't provide the returns that a venture investor is looking for, and they're wading into an unfamiliar space, they're going to push you into things that aren't necessarily the right thing for your business. We've focused on having investors who understand food and consumer packaged goods, you know, fashion and beauty and things like that as well. Um, and they, you know, we do have sector specific, um, you know, CPG investors. And so they understand. Here's how much money we're putting in. Here's our expected return. Um, and they're willing to get in for the long haul and say, let's build this thing and see how far it can go. There are plenty of people who would have given us much more money at even a much higher valuation than we took. But if you do that, you're going to mess up your incentive structure. And everything at a startup is incentives. It's not about maximizing. It's about managing the right alignment because you're building something we're six years in and we have years and years to go. You know, we, we're going to keep growing 50% plus year over year for years to come. So we need to be building for the long term. We can't have somebody who says, but you didn't grow 100x because that's not how food companies work. They don't right. grow 100x, you know, certainly not in, 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 a, in, a, in a couple of year timeline the way that software can. So if you have people, you know, giving you outsized valuations who don't understand the way that you're going to build your business, who push you into doing risky things, you could end up with several hundred million dollars in capital and not the sales to back it up. 
We think that there are some food companies that can build that way, and there are a few that sort of prominently have, but there are a whole lot more that are raising mega rounds right now that probably shouldn't be. And we've been waiting until we had the sales to say now's the right time to raise money because we are we are confident that we've de-risked the next three years, four years of our plan. And that's the plan that we take to investors and we say, here, we're going to build up. And this is probably a little bit more of what you wanted me to say is the actual answer is look at your unit per SKU per store per week. So how many boxes of penne pasta am I selling per store per week? Figure out how much growth I need in the number of points of distribution and in that base velocity in order to reach my sales targets. Figure out if that's reasonable based on the universe of potential retail partners on my, my, you know, product development pipeline on trends that I've seen when I added new SKUs and make sure that you can build bottoms up to your revenue targets. And if you can do that and then you have your story and then you have your consumer love, then you've got a pretty strong case for, Hey, we're going to grow 50 to 100% every year. What I'm hearing from you is that the normal laws of startup physics apply in this sector. There are two ways of doing that. One of raising. One is, you know, uh, raising at valuations that you can grow into, and the fundamentals match the game. And then there's hype games, for companies that get super, a lot of attention, a lot of excitement from the investor community. They get valuations that are uh, unreasonable to to use a, a subtle word for how I feel about it, uh, and they get totally crazy. And you can win in both games. I, I used to think low, uh, poorly of the hype game. But if you can keep playing that game as a founder, you can do very well. I'm sure there's other founders out there that know they're not going to grow into these valuations. But as long as they can trade again or do a secondary, they win. Yeah. They win. Yeah. It's a game of hot potato. Well, and, like the, and the, the thing is, like, the goal is to accomplish your mission, right? Like, the goal is to build a company that lasts. And food companies are around for decades. If you do this right. thing right, you've got decades. You can keep innovating. You can keep making stuff that people love, that their kids will eat, like, you know, that they'll, they'll then feed their kids. And, and the successes in this space, some of them went a really long time. Um, you know, like Annie's or, or Oatly were around for 15 or 20 years before they really heavily capitalized or exited or whatever. And I think that, you know, and then that patience has paid off. Because those companies can have, um, you know, revenue and um, upside. And I think that, you know, and those, those two are very different. They're different examples of something similar. But you don't, need, you don't squander the opportunity to go big and tell a, a crazy big story at any point. You just have more of a track record to do it off of. It's just about whether you're trying to do this to, you know, play it like a tech company or play it with that sort of hype cycle game and whether you want to be in this for the long term or not. And I think for us... If we felt like there was a super scintillating story that would promise a hundred X returns to investors, we would be out there telling that. Now, yeah. we're still more aggressive than a lot of companies in the space. We're not talking about a couple X multiple of our revenue or something like that. Um, there are plenty of companies that work in sort of more commoditized spaces like that, but there's definitely a middle ground of really great high growth brands that are, you know, fulfilling their mission and making their investors happy. And I think investors should look for those. They don't need to invest in something that's telling you that it's a billion pre when it's got $20 million in sales. Well, maybe tip your hand here a little bit and tell the world how uh, VCs, investors, and entrepreneurs should be thinking about the future of food. How is this whole space going to evolve? Where do you think opportunities exist for folks? Um, yeah. So I think, you know, the... The thing that has been most interesting and promising is, you know, over the last 20 years, we've seen about, you know, something approaching 1% a year, really over the last 10 years accelerating, something approaching 1% a year of market share shifting from big food companies to emerging brands. And that suggests that there is a consumer shift that's happening that's, that's driving that. And, and we think we've seen that. Um, now there can be a hype cycle and I'll get to some of the watch outs in a second, but if you really pay attention to what, um, particularly young people, we focused heavily on millennials and Gen Z at Bonza, not just because we are those things, but, um, that's who the consumers of the future are. What choices are they making? What choices do they, you know, do they want for their children? Those are the consumers of the future. 
the amount of dollars that they're going to be spending in food is going to increase dramatically. So what are their values? Can you create something that's values aligned with what their actual problems are, what their actual needs are? So we think the reason that what we're doing works and the companies that we really admire, what they're doing works. The reason is they're thinking about what products will create value for people. The history of the industry is what products will sell. So the problem that you see in food is um, <laughs> there, there are basically at any given time, there are two divergent ways of thinking about it, which is to that point about balance and what we struggle with. Everybody struggles to make the right choices. They want to believe they're doing something healthy, but they want something tasty, right? If we can deliver something that actually is healthy over the long term, we're going to win. That's where the real opportunity is. If you see a trend and you just launch a, a fast follower product, um, you know, suddenly there's a dozen companies in the category and everybody's trying to grab a new piece. Um, sometimes big food companies innovate this way also. You're just, it's just going to be a mess. And, and there's not a long term value creation opportunity there. So we say focus on the younger consumers, focus on what their values are, which is going to be, you know, sustainability and um, health alongside taste. And, you know, don't be afraid to build, um, you know, slightly slower, which is to say, you know, 100% a year instead of trying to build 500 or 1,000% a year. Right. What does the industry need? So um, you've, you've got market segments to target. Yeah. What, what, what do, as an entrepreneur, what tools are you wishing existed, services existed, that so, you hope someone listening to this will go and build? Um, you know, there's been a proliferation of technology companies that are providing services to food and CPG companies. I just think we need more talent to keep coming into this space. Um, you know, the key to building any company is, is talent. Um, you know, I, I think people who want to create real change in, in the world um, should recognize that there's an opportunity to have a huge impact on the environment where, you know, one third of um, greenhouse gas emissions are tied to the food industry. We now think, um, you know, there's a huge opportunity to make an impact on human health and healthcare because food is the most important component to that. Um, we want people to keep coming in and doing this, whether they're joining companies or starting companies. The industry is expanding. And that's my point about all the market share being stolen, right? Like the industry is expanding. There are more companies than ever. Um, there are more good small companies than ever. Um, you know, don't just go join the big ones, um, but view this as an opportunity to, to, to really change things. Um, and, and make sure that you're finding those companies that, again, are trying to actually create value for people as opposed to just saying, boy, I bet I can sell a lot of beads. And I think that's, you know, that's, yeah. that's the thing that, that we help people do. It seems to me that there's a need for impact in the food world beyond the commercial side. I remember, I don't know if I got this right, but I'm pretty sure I do, that the government has designated pizza as a vegetable, yeah. right? C crazy things uh, have yeah. gotten through legislation. What, would, what, is, what needs to change, if anything, if you were king? How would you rewrite law to help uh, the, the public get healthy, good food options? I mean, that's a very complicated question, um, but you're absolutely right that it needs, it needs attention. Um, Another uh, fun anecdote for people, um, in order for a product to be considered a protein in schools, you have to literally put another animal protein on it. So if we wanted to serve Bonza as a protein pasta um, for maybe, you know, um, in order to replace an animal-based protein, they would have to put a meat sauce or a cheese on it in K through 12. Wow. That's, that's just like an impossible disaster for us to try to change the way that people eat. So. That's how strong your lobbies are in meat and in sugar and in dairy. Um, I think, you know, there are documentaries that have covered this ground very, very well. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes they can Did be you recommend scary. Some? Um, I'm going to, they're going to slip my mind now that we're live on this thing. Um, like ones there, like What the Health? Yeah. Over knives, so those yeah, other, oh, the other ones that grab you? Um, we'll link to them in the show notes for folks. Yeah, I need to. I need to go back. It's okay. You can do it after the show. But schools that I can't oh. remember the name of right now. That was the one that just got me, and I was like, "Oh man!" Like you know, soda companies are just up there making sure that they've got fountains in schools and stuff like that, and that they're taking out cooking equipment and the potatoes and vegetable and like all this sort of stuff. There's definitely a huge policy component to it, 
But really, like, there's an innovation component to it, too, because you can't just legislate your way out of problems. You have to make sure that there are, you know, well-built solutions that will make people happy to eat healthier products. If you don't do that, like, you're not going to, like, you can't solve structural problems purely with legislation. You really need, and I think we've seen this in, in tech and in medicine over the last year, you need the private sector to step up and have people innovate in ways that are values aligned. And, you know, I think that's the future of the industry. It seems like they're stifling some innovation with some of these requirements, right? Like having Almost, to put meat yeah. on a vegetable protein to call it a protein. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 there, and, and companies are working on this. Um, but, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, and, you know, same on the um, agriculture and sustainability side. And there's, 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 just, there's a lot of stuff. Um, you is, know, is there a coalition for the, the smaller group of companies out there? Uh, to do lobbying, have you guys tried to counteract some of the corrupt behavior? This will be the first conversation I've had where the concept of lobbying even entered the equation. Um, I think uh, you know, for us, we've still viewed ourselves as too small, um, but it's a good idea, and I'm sure um, some of the plant-based meat companies are out there doing it because it's it's very important for for what they want to accomplish as well. And if you're right that they're taking one percent market share a year, eventually they're going to have spending power in aggregate, even if it's fragmented. So. Yeah, I think we may okay. already. Um, I think I think you're right that working together is, is, is you know part of the future. Cool. Um, I want to switch gears to, to one more topic before we uh, before we cut for today. So I, I know you landed in Bonza via your your experience at Venture for America. Uh, for those listening, you were in the senior management of Venture for America. Can you tell us a little bit about the program? Yeah. Um, so Venture for America. Um, has, has grown and changed a little bit. What we've been trying to do is um, send young people to careers in startups and entrepreneurship um, in cities that have relatively fewer startups and entrepreneurs, um, rather than just sending people to um, you know, New York, Silicon Valley, um, into tech companies or consulting firms or uh, law firms or banks or you know, other, other sort of Fortune 500 companies. Um, we're saying, hey, go smaller, go earlier, um, go to cities like Detroit, New Orleans, Providence, Cincinnati. Um, those are some of our first cities. Um, and, and that's a great proving ground for a young person to learn how to operate a company, potentially become an entrepreneur themselves. So far, v- so VFA is up to about 200 kids per class, comparable with the size of a business school. And since inception in 2012, there have been about 200 companies started by VFA alumni, um, including um, you know, the likes of Bonza. And, um, it's been really, it's been really fun and and exciting to see that network and community build, um, you know, and and sort of be an alternative professional path that's a little bit more brightly lit. And lately, um, I've really admired how the organization has has um, taken more of a focus on underrepresented groups getting into entrepreneurship, um, and, and they've been um, more successful there um, in in recent years as well. How has the group performed? And uh, and uh, I'll, I'll say I used to be on one of the litany of boards for Venture for America, the Entrepreneur Board. Um, how is how has the organization performed in achieving the mission? You know, I think what we've been able to do is to create, you could say, the equivalent of a Harvard Business School for entrepreneurs, except mm. we did it without um, charging you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, you don't have to pay to do this program. You actually get paid by a company. Um, we've been able to help, um, you know, hundreds of startups around the country build and grow um, by getting access to talent, um, you know, that really wants to work hard and um, is willing to move there that wasn't going to move to Detroit or New Orleans otherwise. And again, going on to start a couple hundred companies that have collectively raised hundreds of millions of dollars is, is you know, and, and some of them have exited, although we're very early in the life cycle of the of most of these businesses, you know, like that's a, you know, we, we think it's off to a roaring start and we think that there can't be too many programs that contribute to building a stronger innovation ecosystem in this country and that take all kinds of different approaches to do it. And I think, you know, VFA has definitely found its place as one of those programs. That's awesome. Yeah. You guys were, there, there was an, uh, another dimension in terms of mission, which was to help reinvigorate those cities. What did you guys learn through the process about what it takes to kind of breathe life into communities around innov- with regard to innovation? Yeah, you know, I think 
Um, one thing is the country is probably in a better position economically than it was in 2011 when we started this and we were recovering from a really brutal recession. Um, so um, the macroeconomic trends have favored that. I also think that innovation and startups are just way more in vogue than they were at some level back then. Um, I think that this last year has proven that you can have a distributed team, you can build a great company from anywhere. You know, we're having this conversation virtually. Um, that's the new normal for how you can build companies. And these are like really super cool, but lower cost of living cities, um, where all of a sudden you're seeing more investment dollars going in those directions. You're seeing good companies come out of different places. Um, you know, and, and I think, um, there are still just a couple of really credible startup super hubs in the country, but there are a lot of smaller communities that have grown, um, you know, over the last, uh, eight or 10 years. Awesome. Thank you for all of that. Last question for you. What's the most important thing you've learned as an entrepreneur? A little bit of wisdom you could leave for the audience. Um, I think, um, you know, I guess for, for me, the most important thing I've learned building companies, because I don't know if I'd call myself an entrepreneur, um, building companies is that it's all about the people in the team. Um, and, and there's a couple of good reasons for that. Um, I have a rule. Um, that I call the first 10 rule, which is whenever I make a hire, um, I want to make sure that it's someone that I would have hired in the first 10 people of the company. And that's because um, so many things will change over the course of your time that you need people who are adaptable and who are who have that figure it out mindset. Also, those are the people who are motivated and nonlinear aspirational thinkers, and they're going to continue to be that as you grow. And, you know, that makes the company more able to take on new challenges and grow and succeed when you change what you're doing. And if you surround yourself with those people, like the key to continuing to work on startups and growth stage businesses is to be hyper motivated every day. And you're going to be most motivated when you're working with a group of people who impress you. And I think, you know, my happiness at at VFA and then at Bonza has been driven by building an organization that's just like chock full of people who we would have loved to have had in our first 10. Um, and I think if you can build your team that way for as long as humanly possible, you will end up with a really exciting organization that will always rise to meet the challenges.